From religion to wrestling, gumbo to grits, politics to poetry, and all things Southern in between, this is Take on the South. Produced by the Institute for Southern Studies and hosted by the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of South Carolina, Take on the South examines the highs and lows of the American South, examines the truths and fictions of the country's most distinctive region, and picks the brains of some of its most accomplished students. To understand the South, you need to take it on, and that's what we'll be doing. Join us as we Take on the South. Today, your host gets his history geek on, because in the studio, we have one of the most talented historians of the American South and author of one of the most important books ever written on the region. Today's guest is Professor Peter H. Wood, formerly of Duke University. Peter studied at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar and returned to Harvard for a PhD. He is author of Black Majority, Negroes in Colonial South Carolina from 1670 through the Stoner Rebellion which has rightly been described as one of the most influential books on the history of the American South of the past 50 years. In fact, it was published 50 years ago, and that's one reason why he's joining us in the studio today. Peter, welcome to Take on the South. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's great to, great to have you again, because in 1999, we celebrated at the Institute the 25th anniversary of Black Majority. We did. Yeah. I remember it well. Well, I was a new faculty member here at the time, and I remember it, and it's just lovely to have you back. Good. Thank you. Peter, before we get into the substance of what is a classic, um, let's step back just a bit and tell us about how a, a bloke from St. Louis ends up at Oxford, Harvard, and then kind of in South Carolina. What's your trajectory as an historian? Were you always interested in history or did it come across you suddenly? It, my father was a doctor. I, I was born in St. Louis in 1943. So that gives you a marker. And my father was a doctor trained at Johns Hopkins. Um, and my mother was a scientist um, and they sort of assumed I was going to be a doctor mm. too, but yeah. it turns out I fainted at the sight of blood. So I, <laughs> Fair I was not going to be a doctor, <laughs> though I wrote a chapter about disease in Black Majority as a homage to my father. And a, and a blo think. bloody book too, and right? Yeah. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, and so I grew up really with the civil rights movement, not in it, but watching it from the distance. Mm -hmm. And actually... Um, my first understanding of race, if as for many millions of, of young white American schoolboys, was seeing Jackie Robinson play in St. Louis in 1950 huh. and realizing that everyone in the right field bleachers, mm -hmm. all black, were rooting for Jackie Robinson. Yep. And I thought, there's my God, there's something in the world bigger than baseball. Uh -huh, you know, that uh -huh. if, if people in St. Louis could root for the hated Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> right. And my father explained, you know, no, he's a Negro, and they're, they're you know, da da da, yeah. and that planted the seed. And and um, but I went on through a very silver spoon private education. I uh, my my parents were rather liberal. They both came from Massachusetts. But they believed in education, mm -hmm. and they wanted their five children to get a good education. And so, so I was very lucky to have wonderful teachers, uh, but, but very limited socially in mm -hmm. that I had, you know, a very limited uh, experience with the diversity of America or the depths of American class. Um, and it really wasn't until I was in graduate school at Harvard that by that time it was 1967 mm -hmm. and I knew I wanted to study early American history, but I also knew that I wanted to contribute to the civil rights movement going on around me. And the Detroit riots took place in July of 67, five days, dozens of people killed, and the... CBS News reporter Roger Mudd was flying around in a helicopter over Detroit, and he was supposed to be explaining to us what was going on in Detroit, and he clearly didn't have a clue mm -hmm. 
why are all these black people living in Detroit and how did they get there? Where did they come mm. from? Mm. It was, and, and I literally went to the Harvard Library the next morning to try to find where my interest in colonial history could intersect with my interest in what would eventually become African-American history. Mm -hmm. It hardly existed as a field in those days. And I started in Maine and worked down through Massachusetts and Connecticut and New Jersey looking for books about early black history. And there were one or two articles about a few folks, and you get to Virginia, and there were a couple of books. And I got to South Carolina, and there was nothing, absolutely nothing. And if you're a graduate student looking for a thesis <laughs> topic, this looks pretty exciting Perfect. because you're trying to find something that your professors That's don't right. know about. And I had wonderful professors teaching early American history, and they had literally never mentioned South Carolina, certainly never been there. Um, and they had the good grace to say, well, you can go look. We don't think you're going to find anything, but you can go look. Okay. And, of course, when I got here to Columbia in, in uh, 1970 and started to look uh, in the Carolina Library and in the State Archives, which were over on Senate Street, um, and uh, I found more than I my commit. My father was a doctor, as I said, and the first thing a doctor does is take a history. You know, when did you start feeling this way? And that was sort of my approach to colonial history, was let's go back to the beginning Mm -hmm. and then see, and then move forward. Um, And so I was going to start in 1670 when the colony was founded and see how far I could go. And I thought, maybe I'll have to go to 1830 before I have enough (laughs) to to make a book out of. And by the time I got to 1740, I, I, I had a book in my hands. <laughs> yeah, and did, yeah. to the surprise of, of my professors and to the delight of New York publishers, because they were desperate to find books on black history yeah. at that point. Yeah. You know, suddenly yeah. there was pressure mm-hmm. within the academy to, for more black history. Um, and so Alfred Knopf, this prominent New York publisher, just said, we'll take it. Yeah. Within two weeks. Oh, and I goodness. thought, okay, they'll want me to revise it and fix it. No, we're going to publish it next month. Is that <laughs> you know, right? Boom. I mean, they, they were, they, all the New York publishers were, were absolutely desperate. And I, I'll, I'll tell you a, a funny but predictable story. They said, go talk to our publicity agent. Uh-huh. Um, I walked in a big, burly, blonde New York woman, you know, all elbows, ready to go fix things, and her jaw just dropped when I walked in the room. And she said, oh, Dr. Wood, I I thought you were black. Uh And then she pulled herself together and she said, that's okay, I'll get you on the radio. (laughs) Of course you did. (laughs) So here we are on the radio. (laughs) But in those days, anybody who who had something to contribute was being welcomed, so I was lucky. Sure. Um, just to satisfy my curiosity, who directed your dissertation? Um, Bernard Balin, okay. who was a leading, the leading yes. early Americanist. And it was an interesting paradox. Harvard, was a, I was there as an undergraduate and later as a graduate student. And they were wonderful, impressive historians. But the institution was very New England centered. Mm-hmm. And in fact, some of the most exciting work in early American history was being done in New England, now that people had computers, they were starting to study New England towns. Yes. And the Puritans kept yes. wonderful records of yes. who was Steam born and who died. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and 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 John Demos yeah. and, and Ken Lockridge and a whole group of authors. So that was very exciting, but it was about New England. Yeah. And I got to know these people and see what they were doing. It was exciting. And I also realized, or in at least subconsciously, that you know, there was lots of radicalism going on in the late 60s. The Vietnam War was aflame. Um, but I realized that as a historian, demography is about as radical as you can get because everybody counts. Mm. To do a really good study of Columbia, South Carolina, mm-hmm. or Buenos Aires, or whatever mm-hmm. you're looking at, you need to count everybody. And they all count equally yeah. in the demography. Yeah. And hence the title of my book, Black Majority. I mean, my first notion was, 
I just want to put these people on the map yeah. because South Carolina, early South Carolina history at that point was almost totally white, you know, and the first references to African Americans came in the antebellum period and the cotton boom. And I was in a world very, you know, much more, more much more further, much further away than that. So to give our listeners a bit of context here, um, very little had been written on any Southern colonial history, African American history, and you're right entirely. It was largely antebellum. It was a, the kind of 1800 to 1860 period, and that's largely Peter because people had access to the slave narratives, the Rawick slave narratives. They could hear African American voices coming through from the past. You didn't have that. You did not have anything like the Rawick slave narratives. How did you deal with it? I mean, demography is one thing, right? We know there's right. a black majority right. by, what, 1710. Right. But well, we didn't know then. Well, you, we, because of you, <laughs> now we, we know. Now we, we know. know. Right. Which, by and the that way, was a surprise. You know, one but, of the things about your book is that, you, you know, you have these paragraphs and they, they teach you so much. But what people don't understand is the work that went into that paragraph because <laughs> it is not an easy thing to do. I mean, how did you do the counting? There's no census before 1790. Well, I mean, there's lots of ironies here. One thing that I discovered very early was that because enslaved people were property mm -hmm. and had a monetary value for the white folks, they kept actually quite good records, mm. uh, record, records of incoming slave ships, records of people on the plantation. Um, and so I went in, as we've said, this was a black hole, so to speak. I mean, there was very, almost no scholarship, wondering if I could find anything and was immediately surprised that I could, I could look at a book, uh, pull one off the shelf and look in the index under Negro or black or slave, mm -hmm. and there would be no references. Mm -hmm. And then I would go through the book and there would be lots of references. They just hadn't bothered to index them yeah. because they didn't think it was important. So almost from the beginning, I was finding more than I expected yeah. and certainly more than my mentors uh -huh. expected. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so that was very positive. Sure. You know, now, as you know, many of the sources were white and were planter sources. I used some, you know, papers of planters and slave traders as well as many other things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that just means you have to read critically and read between the lines. Mm -hmm. But it also means that you broaden your notion as a historian. If you're writing about Ben Franklin in Philadelphia, you've got enough papers to work with and you've got diaries and congressional records. You've got all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, if you're studying African Americans in colonial South Carolina, there's limited written material, but there are clues to other disciplines that you could use. So as I said, I, got, I wrote a chapter about disease yeah. and, and that was enlightening for me. I wrote a chapter about language mm -hmm. because the Gullah language was important but had never been written about in a very positive way, mm -hmm. except Lorenzo Turner, a couple of people had, but most of the linguists were themselves white racists mm -hmm. and thought that these people spoke differently because they had, you know, fat lips and small, uh, flat noses and so on, just crazy mm -hmm. stuff without any understanding of where Gullah really right. came from, you know. So it pushed you into using other disciplines, mm -hmm. archaeology, linguistics, whatever you needed to try to find out about these people. So... If you could, if somebody, if an undergraduate to come up to you and ask you, say, Professor Wood, can you just give me, you know, um, the thumbnail sketch? What is black majority about? I get that you're saying there's a black majority, but what, what, what's the main thrust of this book? Well, I've just done a new edition of the book. And I had to, I changed the subtitle because it had Negroes 50 right. years ago. Mm -hmm. Now the subtitle is Black Majority, um, Race, Rice, and Resistance okay, you go. from 1670 to 1740. Yep. And right in the middle there is the word rice. 
And that was the biggest, most controversial contribution because um, people had, the, Africa was the dark continent. These people contributed nothing. The story went that they were lucky to be here and they would get Christianity and all kinds of glorious things. Um, and what we knew about colonial America in the South was mostly about Virginia, so those people grew tobacco. And then we knew about the 19th century, the cotton boom. And I can still stump a, a room full of high school teachers or college professors by saying, you know, what, what, not only which colony was black at the time, well, more than half black at the time of the revolution, which was the richest colony, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how did they get rich? What was the crop? Right. Right. And, and people think it's a trick question, mm -hmm. you know? And, mm -hmm. and so I argued, and there's a chapter called uh, Black Labor, White Rice, mm -hmm. and the argument is that um, it was the Africans from West Africa, not all of them, but many of them knew how to grow rice. And the low country proved to be a, a, a very uh, applicable place for that crop. And the early colonists from Europe were desperate to find the right crop. I mean, they experimented for 20 years and just ran cattle in the marshes to try to hang on until they could figure out some crop that they could grow. It turned out to be rice. Um, and, and that... Uh, was a surprise to say the least for, for most people. But again, it jumped out of the records. And now it's jumping out of aerial photographs mm -hmm. and LIDAR probing. And we're now finding out that there were twice as many rice fields in South Carolina as we thought mm -hmm. 30 years ago. You know, we're, we're, so we're still learning things all the time. One of my former students, Carolyn Grego, uh, just last year wrote an article about using the Cayendo, which is a West African digging tool, which she found here in South Carolina, that lo and behold, um, these people were using those. But, but the Cayendo shovel, the, the fanner basket for winnowing rice, those things were used to death. You know, and they're organic. They disappear. Mm -hmm. You know, you use mm -hmm. your fanner basket till it falls apart, and then you make another one. Um, and so we're learning new things all the time about this. So, so again, it's very difficult to explain to um, people who aren't historians just what an intervention you were making, because you're entirely right. A, there wasn't any African-American history for colonial South Carolina, or the South generally. Yeah. A few gestures for Virginia, notwithstanding. Right. No, Vir Virginia. That's important because Virginia was the South right. for most folks. Right. Uh, you know, right. that was a vestige right. of the. It of wasn't the North Civil Carolina. Wars. It wasn't North Carolina, <laughs> and it wasn't Georgia. South Carolina. Right. Because I remember the first book I picked up said something like, "You can't really understand South Carolina history unless you were born." under a palmetto tree, you know, with a mockingbird singing to you. you know, it was basically a gentle way of saying, keep out, right. we'll, we'll tend to our own history, Interior. we'll write it the way we want to, yeah. and don't come tell us what happened here. Proudly provincial, right? Right, yeah. 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 And so, but here you are, not only sort of identifying this, this topic that hadn't been identified, but you're making a kind of, I, I guess this is where scholarship meets activism, right? You're making... Um, an activist statement about what some people call agency and who's doing the labor, like who is actually doing the labor and not just manual labor, this is intellectual skilled labor and it's rice. And rice is the thing that makes South Carolina the richest colony on the eve of the revolution. Absolutely. On the backs of enslaved black people. Absolutely. And and the key word there is is skill. You know, I mean, what I learned as a kid was that this was unskilled mm -hmm. labor that was brought over and people had to be taught what to do and told what to do. And again and again, we discover ways in which the Africans knew more about this kind of climate and this kind of situation than the Europeans. Right. I mean, a good example, I've, just, I've been writing articles recently about dugout canoes. And the Native Americans in this region used dugout canoes to move up and down the rivers. 
And in West Africans use dugout canoes all the time uh, for fishing, for traveling, for, uh, and uh, and the Europeans not so much. Right, you know, right, so so right. in these narrow, twisty rivers, they they weren't sure how to play it. They had never seen an alligator. Mm-hmm. Uh, West yeah. Africans had seen crocodiles right. and knew exactly yeah. how to deal with them, yeah. when to stay away, and yeah. how to kill them when you needed sure, to. Sure. And, you know, rattlesnakes was absolutely freaked out the Europeans. Yeah. On, on the one hand, it was a sign that they maybe they were in Eden because there was this right. venomous snake, but there was there were myths of the rattlesnake in Europe, you know, like don't go to South Carolina, there are mm-hmm. these venomous snakes with rattles on their tails, that are totally crazy. And, uh, and they had to sort of damp that down and say, no, you know, you should come here anyway, the rattlesnakes aren't that bad. You know? Don't tread on me. And don't yeah. tre- <laughs> uh, don't <laughs> you go, right. exactly. talk about incorporation, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, watch out for that. So, so, I mean, there is something else worth noting here too. Um, as you pointed out, most of the books are on the antebellum period, and that really covered a sort of 40-year, 50-year history. And I know you were planning to go to maybe 1820, but you still covered a lot of years here. I mean, we're talking, what, 70 years. That's a big arc. And historians, at least many of them, increasingly slice their, their time scale smaller and smaller. You might get 10 or 15 years or 20 years. Biting off 70 years it's a lot. It's, I mean, it's a lot of work, isn't it? It I mean, is. How it, long were you in the library for, I guess, right. is what I'm asking. <laughs> right. And I, what brought me to an end was discovering the Stono Rebellion, which we haven't mentioned yet, but it was the well, largest slave to. rebellion in North American history. Yeah. And no one had ever heard of it. Yeah. So I made sure in the first edition to put Stono Rebellion in the subtitle yeah. just so that people would have to write it down and yeah. ask what it was, even if they didn't That's r- right. read the book. But so it's 70 years. It's, it seems like a long time. It's also relatively small number of people compared to, to more recent yeah. periods and, mm-hmm. and topics. Um, but what I see even more clearly now is what a crucial 70 years it was. And I, I have come to call it, and others have, have picked up on this too, is say from, from 1660 when... when the colony is just being thought of, uh, and the restoration in England from 1660 to 1710, let's say, those, so those 50 years, roughly speaking, I call it the terrible transformation. Because this is when you go, the, the distinguishing feature in the 17th century for all these colonizing cultures was are you a Christian or not a Christian? Mm-hmm. If you're not a Christian, I can enslave you, and I've got biblical texts that tell me I can do that. And if I've enslaved you because you're a Muslim, you, or you might say, really? You mean if I convert mm-hmm. to Christianity, I'm free? Mm-hmm. You know that. So there was a loophole there yeah. in which you yeah. could you could get, and and so the shift takes place in that period from religion to race. It's like, no, I made a mistake. I, I didn't uh, exploit you because you're a heathen. Uh-huh. I'm exploiting you because you're a different color. Right. And the leopard cannot change its spots. Mm-hmm. You know, you're mm-hmm. going to be that way, and yeah. you'll be easy to identify. Um, when Georgia becomes a colony uh, in the 1730s, it's an all-white colony. Right. So any black person who escapes from South Carolina into Georgia right. is pretty easy to, to spot. Yeah. But, and, and, of course, once you then shift to this racial justification, you then have to create a logic to go with it you know, which is the birth of American racism. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to explain why these, and they eventually went so far as to say, you know, there's, this is a separate race. I mean, there were debates about, are these people, are we even related to these people? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and so that's, that's where American racism begins. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think, that's why I've done this, expanded edition of Black Majority is that I think we're constantly asking why do we still have all these racial issues buzzing around in our culture and it's because we need to go we need to see how 
how deep the foundations are. You know, this was yeah. not something that happened and then there was a civil war and it ended. Right. No, this is generation after generation after generation. Um, living in the what I call slave labor camps, what we used to call plantations, you know, but, but they really are slave labor camps, mm-hmm. you know, where nine-tenths of the people are their slaves and they're there to do labor and they can't leave, you right. know, and they're there for life. I'm working now on a book about forced illiteracy because they're not only contained physically, they're contained mentally in terms of you're not, if, if, if I'm enslaved and you catch me with a book, I might lose my thumbs, you know, or I, you know, I will pay a terrible price. I might get sold to Mississippi, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, and, and that goes on for generations, you know. Hence the outburst of education after the Civil War mm-hmm. and the creation of HBCUs and black schools and the desperate need to, to catch up and get involved in serious education, especially to be able to read the Bible, right. you know, which was a huge motivation for right. many people. Um, this, something has always struck me about black majority, and that, that's your attention to the power of the written word. To say it's a beautifully written book is really an understatement. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, you referred to your footnotes as academic cobblestones. And, and you, I did. You said, readers, please ignore those. And they really shouldn't because they're beautiful footnotes. Um, but what you're trying to do is get people to read about this important project, right? Um, and I didn't, rea- I didn't realize that Knopf like, took it and published it within a month. I mean, that's well, remarkable. and you have to understand that this was a doctoral dissertation. Yeah. And the first people you need t- to please are your mentors yeah. at the right. university, but also the, the non-field more generally. I mean, obviously going in, I felt an extra burden to show that this can be done. Yeah. You know, and so anything I found, I wanted to put it in a footnote. Yeah. And often, if if I had five examples, I'd put the best two in the text. But then the footnote says I got three more of these right. things. So right. don't don't think this That's is right. the only one. Right. You know, I bet there's even more if we keep looking. Right. You know, and that idea of trying to send a message mm-hmm. that we can do this. And my thinking was this: I call it the worst case scenario. If I could go, I wanted to go as far south as I could and as far back as I could chronologically. And if I can show that you can write a book about slavery in early South Carolina, then you ought to be able to write a book about um, you know, slavery in antebellum Georgia or Jim Crow, Alabama, or some, you know, that, yeah. that by definition you're going to have more records to right. deal with and more right. opportunities. You yeah. know? But if we can crack this hardest nut, that should spring loose every, a lot of other people yeah. To, to, yeah. to go do their thing. Yeah. I, th- I, think, I, mean, I think the way you wrote that book is one reason for its enduring attraction to people. It's, it's clear and it's powerful. And there's an economy of prose in it. I mean, it, it's, it's tight because it has to be tight. What did, what did Professor Balin say when you handed in your dissertation? What was, I mean, what was his expectation for this? Well, I've said, um, I, I've said that he had the good grace to let me tackle mm-hmm. this subject. Ironically and predictably maybe, when I turned it in, um, he said, that's, that's good, you've wrapped this up. Like, okay, we don't need to think about South Carolina anymore. <laughs> we're done and, now. Yeah, I mean, my notion was, I've, as I just said, we're opening things up. You know, <laughs> this is just the beginning. Let's, uh-huh. let's really go for it now. And, but he, he said, well, you've, you've wrapped things up. But he also, he had a wonderful um, perverse notion. of. He was a very powerful professor, so many of his students ended up coloring in the squares, you know, doing what he was doing in another colony or doing so very right. imitative but, but creative. But he, he kind of liked it when somebody got out from under mm-hmm. and did something different. He, he, and, he, and he would react to it by trying to learn more about it than you knew. <laughs> so 
when I wrote my first chapter and handed it in to him, I thinking I was really on to something, uh-huh. he said, well, that's good. What do you think about Grant? And I said, Grant, what do you mean, like Ulysses Grant? <laughs> he said, no, no, the, the Grant, the guy who wrote this book called The Fortunate Slave, this Africanist who'd done this study of the man who went uh-huh. back to Africa, you know, I, he had gone to the library and found a book that I hadn't found Ooh. yet. and. And that, he was always upping the ante. So it's like you were playing cards with a very shrewd uh, yeah. antagonist. You know? and, and that was great. Yeah. I mean, it's the way you, know, you want your mentor or your coach to be. They're always raising the bar. You know? And he's, he set the bar pretty high. That's, so, a lovely, that's lovely. And, and with respect both to the research and, and the writing, you know, he, was, he, he believed very much in that historians need to be good writers and and uh, I realized in creating this new edition that I I had written lots of long sentences and lots of long paragraphs that weren't going to read very well in the 21st century and I went through and cut the paragraphs in half and shortened some of the sentences well, and I think you're being changed hard. some I, of the language <laughs> but no that I mean things change well, over they time they you do. know they change over time so but I think you've been a bit hard on yourself there because I think uh, it was a brilliantly written book uh, thank um, you so, um, I mean, we could talk about this forever, really, but um, I suppose my last question is a question about anticipation. So there you were, you'd finished this dissertation, you find that one of the most prestigious presses in New York is going to publish this. You knew you probably had something important on your hands, Peter. But did you realize that it would be so enduringly important? No, I had no idea. But for this funny reason, I really thought I was, I was young. I was under 30. I was still quite naive. I've talked about my naive education. And I've talked about my medical father. Um, and growing up in a scientific world, you think, you learn that If somebody discovers something new that's interesting, it will be presented to the peers and they will review it. And if you've got a a penicillin that really works, you know, then everybody will start using penicillin. I had a kind of naive, I really thought that, okay, this is good. And the, the momentum was with me. I mean, obviously the civil rights movement was was tapering off, but I didn't really know that. We all thought that it was going to grow and grow and grow, mm-hmm. and, and the culture was going to get better, not worse. And um, and so I thought that within 10 years, this will be common knowledge, you know, like the Mayflower is common knowledge. or something. This will be integrated into the story of how America began, and, and therefore that story will make more sense because we had obviously missed a piece. You know, and Peter had found this piece of the puzzle, and if we fit it in there, it seems to fit, and then we'll go on from there. And of course, that didn't happen. You know, and and so it it happened within the academic community. Right. Lots of college students read this book, mm-hmm. and lots, of, but their parents didn't, right. and their cousin Fred in Indiana didn't read it, um, and so it never, we never changed the narrative of early America. And I think that's part of the backlash now against Black Lives Matter and the, is, is like, wait a minute, you know, that's the, the idea that it's woke, you know, maybe this was woke, but, you know, it, it's like it's, it's, it's telling us something that we didn't learn in high school, mm. so wait a minute, where did this come from? You know, and we're yeah. still at that, at that stage. Well, it's woke only in the sense of we've been asleep for too long. Uh, we have indeed. Peter Wood... Congratulations on 50 years for Black Majority, and thank you for being on Take on the South. What a treat to talk with you. This is great. My pleasure. Appreciate it. That was our Take on the South. Let us know yours. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at U of SC South. Take on the South is produced by Matt Simmons of the Institute for Southern Studies. Special thanks to Professor Dave Garner of the University of South Carolina School of Music for composing our music. Tune in next time for another Take on the South. <laughs>